Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sky Observer's Hangout. I'm going to turn my video on here. How y'all doing? My name is Michelle. Welcome to the Adler Planetarium. This Sky Observer's Hangout is so special. We are coming to you live from the Adler in front of our life-size model, the Mars Perseverance rover. We are so excited to have you on the show with us tonight. Um, joining me in our YouTube chat, I want to introduce uh, some folks we have behind the scenes. Our YouTube chat moderator is Jennifer. You've seen some messages scroll by from Jennifer already. If you see the Adler's name highlighted in yellow, that's Jennifer behind the scenes. Um, and she's helping me spot your questions and find out where you're from and all that. And thanks, Jen. Answering questions in the chat is our astronomer friend Geza. If you've been on Sky Observer's Hangout before, you've heard Geza's name. And when you see a name with a little blue wrench to it, that is uh, next to it, that's Geza helping us by answering your questions behind the scenes. Um, so please ask your questions. This is a great night to do it. Sky Observer's Hangout is a place for us to gather together to absolutely nerd out about the nighttime sky and space exploration. Now, our goal is to give you practical tips and tricks that you can find useful about lots of things related to sky observing. Now, if this is your first time, just so you know, you are welcome to just sit back and watch us. That is totally fine. However, we would love to see your questions and comments in the chat. Feel free to interact with us and with each other. So to get this show started, we want to know where are you watching us from? So Jennifer tells me that there are a few folks from Chicago. There's somebody on from Minnesota. Welcome. So continue to tell us where you are watching us from. Um, we'll say hello in just a sec to some more folks. Hey, how about this? You may have noticed I'm here at the Adler. There's people here. We're open. If you want to come visit us, you can do that. Jennifer is going to put a link in the chat in just a little bit uh, about how you can get tickets to come visit us at the Adler and see all of this in person. Um, you can help us by get a little bit more visibility for our shows. If you want to hit subscribe to the Adler Planetarium's YouTube channel, the, bo the button is right below this video. If you like us, you can give us a thumbs up too. Now, where else are you tuning in from? Let us know all throughout the program tonight. We are so happy to have you here. All right. So, if you have watched Sky Observers Hangout before, you know we're usually doing the show like from my front room. Um, this is the first time we've been able to do this show from our solar system exhibit here at the Adler Planetarium. And uh, so at, from, at, from time to time tonight, you're probably going to see me switch my screen and we're going to switch between a couple different cameras. I've got some folks here helping me out as well. And uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to see a little bit of the wizard behind the curtain from time to time here during the show. And so we love showing you what goes on behind the scenes here at the Adler too. All right. So I want to introduce someone else in just a sec who's going to be helping us out with this show. Why don't we, um, oh, I'm going to check and see where other people are signing in from. Ohio, welcome to our viewers from Ohio. Welcome to our viewers from Michigan. It is so great to have you. Um, we get people from all over the world in the last uh, 28 episodes that we've, or 27, 27 episodes that we've had. We've had viewers from 205 countries around the world, and about 1.4 million of you have watched our show. So we are so thrilled to have you. And this is really special for us tonight because we get to show you some stuff that we just completely geek out about. All right, let's go on. Now, in July, the Other Planetarium became the temporary home to this thing right behind me. This is a full-size model of the Mars Perseverance rover. NASA's rover landed on Mars on February 18th of 2021. And since then, the rover has been exploring an ancient river delta in Jezero Crater, looking for evidence in the rocks of liquid water on the surface of Mars in the far distant past. Now, the goal of this rover's mission is to seek evidence in the rocks of past climate change uh, uh, past climate conditions that could have supported ancient life on Mars and to collect samples of rocks and rock pieces and soil for possible future return of those samples on Earth. Now, you're not just going to hear me talk about all this stuff tonight. I've got someone helping me out who knows even more about all this. We're going to turn his camera on. There he is. And we've got his audio on. This is Andrew. He is our vice president for uh, museum, sorry, 
Vice President for Museum Experience and Collections. Here Thank at the you. I, ha good. I blanked. That's the department I'm in too. And I completely blanked <laughs> at that name. Anyway, it's thank all good. You. We're, we're all here we're in the Adler family. We're, exactly. we're on the same team. How you yeah. doing? I'm doing great. I'm really happy to be here, Michelle, in front of this amazing machine that we're going to be showing off to people tonight. Yeah, this is this is really cool. Well, to get us started, we're going to take a look at a quick video clip that we created here at the Adler using open space. Open space is an open source space visualization software system. And we want to get a sense of what Mars is like um, and where on Mars the Perseverance rover landed. So give me just a second. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, by the way, hello to our viewers in Denver. Thanks for coming. All right. So there we go. And I've got a video here. Uh, we're going to take you from space in and down to the surface of Mars. Let's go. We're starting with a fly into Mars in just a second. Here we go. Great. So as we're moving in there, th this allows us to see the orbital path of Mars. That's the line that you see going off to the left there. And as we get closer, you'll start to see Mars is a different place than, th than the Earth. Those two lines, by the way, are the two moons that orbit around Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Now we just faded into a, we're diving into the north polar ice cap of Mars. Mars has polar ice caps, the, the change with the seasons. Mars has seasons, kind of like Earth. Now we're going to be going and seeing one of the biggest features on Mars. Mars is about half as wide as the Earth in terms of diameter, but it has the biggest volcano in the solar system. This is Olympus Mons. As I said, not only the biggest volcano in the solar system, but the biggest volcano, well, biggest volcano Mars and in the solar system. Mars is dominated by massive volcanic features. This is part of an entire uh, part of the planet called the Tharsis Plateau. Now we're going into Valles Marineris. If you see in front of you here, that thing that looks like a canyon, that is, in fact, it's the biggest canyon in the solar system. So Mars has the biggest volcano and the biggest canyon. Now we've just moved to a different place on Mars. It's a place called Gale Crater, where the previous rover landed in 2012 called Curiosity. Curiosity is a rover that's very similar to the one that we have here at the Adler right now. The foot footprint is uh, uh, very similar. And this is one of the landing sites chosen to understand how Mars has changed through time. Now we're gonna finish by going into Jezero Crater, which is the area where the Perseverance rover was sent. Another example of a place where we see evidence of changes on Mars. There's evidence on Mars that it, there used to be more water than there is today. We see evidence of moving water. And in this case, we're moving into a part of the edge of Jezero Crater. It's just coming into view now at the top of the screen there. That's what we call an inverted delta. It looks like water flowed into this really massive crater and left behind this feature that was later uh, eroded around the edges and formed what we call that inverted delta. So it's a good place to try to understand what kind of features were formed by water on Mars. And if there, that it, as it formed, Mars had to have been warmer and wetter. And that's why we wanna see when did it change, how and why. That's one of the missions of this amazing machine. So it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the landing site of the rover because this wasn't the only landing site that was considered. There were a few, um, but why this one? What, what excited you? I know you in particular love oh. a, a, the inverted delta possibilities there, but what intrigued scientists and you about the landing site for this rover here? Right. This is a particularly intriguing spot because it's the, the, it was aimed to be on a spot that was as it's formed by flowing water. This water was flowing into this depression, which was formed by an impact crater that was much older, and then left behind all the sediment, thus forming these layers of rock that were formed by moving water. The kind of features that we see on Earth all the time. So if you want to pick a spot that's a good landing spot to try to understand what Mars was like long ago when it was quite probably warmer and wetter, this would be a good spot to try to find that kind of evidence to find not only look at the physical structure of the rock layers that were laid down, but the chemical signatures for what kind of minerals were present, which can give us an idea of what the atmosphere was like and how close it was to being possibly habitable. That's cool. Well, this isn't, so Perseverance and Curiosity, they aren't the only missions that are out there. Um, I wanna share with you just really quickly, if you want to go find more resources and more information um, about where, uh, about all the various Mars exploration, uh, what 
uh, the missions are and everything that's going on. Um, Mars.nasa. Gov. Very simple for this particular uh, uh, for this particular web address, and you can go and see all sorts of really interesting things and get the latest news and images. Um, all right, we are going to stop sharing, and we're going to go back to this rover. Uh, give me just a second, and hang on. Just going to my Zoom here. There we go. All right, I'm gonna turn this camera off and we're gonna go to the camera that's showing us the rover itself because now we get to pick out some of our favorite bits and pieces on this rover model. It is a life-size model of the rover. So I'm going to turn that one off. There we go. All right, and I'm gonna come into view here. And so this is where we uh, we get to ad lib a bit. <laughs> we get no, to- No, it's all good. We, yeah, it's all good. So where there shall we start? I, let, let's start maybe with the main body of it. So in just a few minutes, we're going to hear from an expert who's on the, the, the mission team for this. But we thought we'd start by giving you a tour over this thing that is looks like a car. It is the size and mass of a small car. We always say, think Cooper Mini. That's about sort of what you're looking at here. So the main body is this large rectangular shaped thing here. And then in front of us here, Hunter, could you, Hunter is behind the camera here. Hello, Hunter. Uh, could, could you could you move down just a little bit towards the floor? There you go. So you, you're seeing a couple of the wheels right now. This vehicle actually has six wheels to it, and it's designed away with, with what we call a bogey mount on either side, so that it can drive up and over uh, uh, well rocks and 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 and, uh, and obstacles like that. It can defeat almost any obstacle you can throw at it. Although of course the scientists and engineers always talk about you know what they're able to climb into and out of. Next stop might be the mast. What do you think? That would be great. That's my favorite part. So this is the thing st standing up. And up here, we've got the main, uh, uh, these are the cameras that give us a view over the landscape. We have a pair of, of stereoscopic cameras here. But this large instrument here, which is actually a laser. And what that does is it zaps rocks. And then the, it, 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 the, there's an instrument that can detect the gases that are given off by the tiny explosion. We can tell what rocks are made of even by far away from even without touching from, them. From 20 feet away, they can figure out what rocks are made of. So if there's a rock that's inaccessible or they have so many things that they can't just drive up to them all, then, uh, yeah, you can you can zap it from uh, up to about 20 feet away, which is pretty Incredible. cool. Go ahead. Um, Hunter, if you could scroll over here. Let's try to – I'll stand over here. There we go. Behind me here is an arm that is usually folded up to the side when it landed on Mars. But of course, to do it science, what it would do is a reach out. And then the end of the arm is this very big package here of, of instruments for detecting what rocks are made of, what sort of, what sort of uh, uh, minerals in there. There's very tiny cameras for taking uh, almost microscopic views, or actually, no, microscopic views to, uh, of these rocks, and a, and a bit, a, a large drill, rather, that can drill into rocks so we can get some samples not just on the outside of the rock. That's sometimes important because you want to be able to find out what the rock is made of, not on the outer surface, but a little bit inside the rock. And then while we're down here, there's a, uh, another set of cameras on the front of the body that are looking out towards this way that give us a really nice view of exactly where the arm is, is, is reaching out. Hunter, could you, could you move up a little bit there? Oh, much better, thank you. Um, and, the, and actually, if you go down that towards Michelle, actually, Michelle, why don't you, uh, how about, and things like uh, communications and power supply on that end, please. Yep, yep, so there are quite a few antennas on this rover to enable it to communicate with Earth. Um, we've got a high gain antenna, which allows it to communicate directly with Earth. We've got a UHF antenna, that's this one right here, which allows it to communicate with uh, orbiting spacecraft. So we've got a lot of different ways to communicate um, with uh, either Earth or orbiting spacecraft act, act, acting as relay systems to be able to get information from the surface of Mars back to scientists on Earth. We've also got the power supply back here. So this is called an RTG. Let me see if I can back up a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. And that is RTG, radioisotope thermoelectric generator. Essentially, this uses the decay of plutonium to generate heat, which through the system generates electricity. So this, this rover does have a finite lifetime. It's based on uh, how much plutonium is still available to be able to uh, generate that electricity. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out when, when uh, Andrew was mentioning the wheels, this is called a, a, a rocker bogey system. And the, uh, 
the scientists and engineers love to say what size rocks they can drive over, which is up to about 16 inches tall. They try to avoid those rocks whenever they can, um, if possible, because honestly, you don't want to drive over a rock if, if, you, if you can help it. If you can drive around it, that's better. You just don't want to get stuck because this thing can't free itself if it does get stuck. All right, Andrew. So t maybe I'll point out two more things. So Hunter, if you could come back to my, my side here. Off on the front here, one thing I, I forgot to point out, there's actually a, a part of the rover here that's it's set up and designed to receive rock samples from the surface. One of the things that Perseverance is doing on Mars is it's, it's just collecting samples from that arm that's behind me here and depositing it in the main part of the, of the rover right here. And then there's a system in there that packs up these samples basically, puts it into a little, uh, a little tube for potential pickup for a future mission to maybe bring these rocks back to Earth. There's some things, some, some things we do in laboratories that you just can't miniaturize enough to fit onto a spacecraft. Things like knowing exactly how old these rocks are. So there are plans that I've actually been changing recently um, uh, for how to act, bring those rocks back. So this thing will be storing these samples for now. Uh, and the, idea, the plan is for, to deposit them on the surface for future pickup. And one of the ways that they may be picking them up is a, a new change, would be something that's hanging over our heads. And so we, Hunter, can you scan up towards the ceiling? We got a call up and a little bit of glare there. That thing, you can't quite, but it's next to the thing that looks like the sun, but it's not. It's a spotlight here at the Adler Planetarium. That is Ingenuity, the helicopter that is flying on Mars right now. They were aiming for five flights. We're up to 29. Is that the right number? So, uh, okay. Uh, and it's been performing so well that the idea now is maybe we can use rotorcraft to pick up these samples on, on a future mission. So, and we, we're going to have, Hunter, if you can scale back down again, or, or back down, we're going to have this here at the Adler Planetarium until, until the end of 2022. So come on out and take a close look at it yourself sometime. One of the things that I also like to point out is there's a little weather station on this rover as well. So right here on the main mast, we've got lots of different weather station related items. And so um, if you go online to uh, JPL's website and you search Mars Jezero Crater weather, you'll be able to access the uh, Jezero Crater current weather report or the weather report as of a few days earlier. Um, and you'll get to see eye watering ranges of high temperature to low temperature it's it's really well, amazing I, I, I freezing ranges of temperatures so, i yeah. freezing uh, ranges yes, exactly yes, yes. <laughs> we never said astronomy jokes were funny but anyway <laughs> um so it's also it can't be stated enough how incredible of a machine this really is and the fact that the people who operate it are here on earth and the rover is a car being driven tens of millions of miles away. It's really amazing. And so we are so lucky in a few minutes, we're going to connect with uh, Vandy Verma, who is a JPL uh, Perseverance rover team member who deals in robotics. So we'll get to her in just a little bit. Uh, but I just want to plug that. So stick around. We've got an actual JPL robot driver who's going to be talking to us about what she does. So anyway, what do you think? This is a pretty cool machine. It's an it's amazing machine. And it's amazing that they can pack the, the, what, well, the one of the reasons I like to share it with the public is that uh, we have it displayed, we should say, with a with another rover that landed way back in 2004. So you can't see it on this view, but come to the other, you'll see it. And uh, it's a much smaller rover and it was able to do a lot of the same kinds of science. The layout is very similar. It has six wheels. It's solar powered instead of the power supply you mentioned, uh, but it really shows the progression of of the technology and the techniques, the tools that we have for exploring these other worlds. We can experiment with, with smaller rovers and then they get bigger and they're more capable. And now these future, this future mission to potentially take these samples and, and scoop up, we're gonna be using more, more uh, uh, aircraft, aircraft flying uh, on another world. It's just incredible that these things can be designed and, and successful, as you said, for millions of miles away. And, and not only that, NASA is even going to send a helicopter to even another world. It's going to send a helicopter called Dragonfly to Titan in the 2030s, um, I believe, is when it's going to launch. Um, so look out. There's going to be helicopters all over the solar system <laughs> at we're, we're, some point. We're, we're taking over the solar system with, it, with we our are, aircraft. We are. We are. One yeah. helicopter at a time. Um, one yeah. thing I, I want to point out, I get asked a lot how the rovers find their way around because, well, Mars 
doesn't have a magnetic field where you can use a compass. There's no GPS. How in the world do these things know where they're going? Well, one way they can get the information to know what direction they're pointed and everything is this little guy right here. This is a sundial. And it sounds so simple, but I want to point out, we have exactly these types of sundials in our historic collection here at the Adler. And you can see them on display. They look just like this, which is amazing because these things are hundreds of years old. Well, and, you, you design a good sundial. It's it's a real simple device right? that works on different planets even. Yep. Right, right. Yep. So if you visit us, if you haven't visited us before, um, about, I don't know, about uh, 100 feet away from where we're standing downstairs on our lower level, you can see gorgeous sundials from our historic collection. Um, but know that the technology is still being used <laughs> on another planet right here. So, but another way they know, they take pictures of the sun, they can figure out, there are various ways to figure out where yeah, the I, rover is going. And, and you can measure the surface location uh, based on relative to the, the, the spacecraft, but also the, the techniques of doing, using the radio signals to determine position in space are amazingly precise, even halfway across the solar system, measuring those little tiny Doppler shift in the radio signal, you, you can get very precise for where you are orbiting or on the surface of the planet. And if the rover ever stops working and has to sit, but it can still communicate, that's even useful to be able to sit there because they can use the ability of it to know where it is precisely using the Doppler shift to, to then start to measure what the interior of Mars is like. It's, yep. it's, it's absolutely uh, the, the things that scientists think of, right? I know. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. So I think we have a couple questions. Oh, all right. Uh, how does the rover send info back to Earth? Oh, yeah, great. So Michelle earlier pointed out the, uh, a couple of the antennas uh, it kind of looks it's uh, it's sort of edge on in the view right now, but it looks like a like a well like a squash racket or a little bit smaller than a tennis racket, right? And that's for communicating directly with Earth. And so these are all digital digital data. It's it's, it's kind of like an internet connection, honestly, and it's transmitted to uh, stations uh, on the Earth. Also, often relayed with other spacecraft that are in orbit with based with using the antenna that's closer to Michelle there. But again, it's it's, it's kind of like a, a data connection you might use. On the internet, the the difference is that the ground stations are very big radio antennas. These are giant dish antennas that are able to scoop up lots of, of radio information. And so, so we're able to stream that data back to Earth. Um, I want to say hello to a couple more folks who are on with us right now. So hello to our viewers in Washington, D.C. And Stockholm, Sweden. Hello, nice. Stockholm. It is probably quite early in the morning where you are. So welcome to you. All right, I've got another question. How does the rover determine the composition of the rocks? Oh, right. So there's a, there's a few different ways. Maybe we'll we'll get some more details from our visiting person soon. But but the our, our favorite way of, of this instrument that uses the it's it's a quite powerful laser, right? That is able to shoot a laser beam and then it it heats up the rock to such a temperature that the that the material vaporizes and and for a split second makes a little cloud of gas. It actually makes a popping noise, which we've we've actually recorded with a um and and what what the uh, what the second instrument is able to do is is look at that little cloud of gas and see how uh, it interacts with, with the, the sunlight, uh, honestly, uh, and, and the light, and you're able to figure out what the gases are in there. And that tells you what elements, the abundance of different elements that are in that rock. And the sound can tell you different things, like just how you can tap different materials and, and tell that a mater one material is different from other based on how you tap it. If you zap this, uh, zap a rock with a laser, it makes a slightly different sound depending on if it's a really hard rock versus a soft rock or, or something. So the sound can tell you important information as well. So cool. Oh. All right. I think that's it for questions for now. Keep those questions coming. I know Geza is probably answering uh, a bunch right now, but we'd love to answer some of your questions live on the show. Um, so please keep those coming. All right. Anything else that you would like to point out before we go on to our special guest? No, I don't think so. We've given people a great uh, overview of all the science tools and also some fun things like a sundial and little decals like NASA and, and the U.S. flag and so forth. Because after you spend a lot of time and putting all these people, remember thousands and thousands of people worked on this mission uh, from all, places all, all over the country and, and some all over the world. You know, they, they, they like to put a little piece of themselves on there. So, they, so they've got little insignias and little things around here. It's just, it's just neat to come and see all the details on this rover. 
Exactly. And then uh, there's also a bunch of people who sent their names to Mars as well. So there's uh, on the rover is uh, essentially a little a little chip that has um, everybody who said, yes, please send my name to Mars. Your your name is on the red planet right now. So. All right. All good. Yeah. Ready good. To go Let's on? Do it. All yeah. right. Um, oh, we have one more question. Uh, how long will the rover continue to transmit data? Oh, well, uh, as long as possible. I mean, curiosity is still going, of course. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the real limiting factor will be the electric power being produced by, by, by the, the RTG. That does slowly but surely uh, fade. But there are some spacecraft, as you know, out there in space that are, I think about the Voyager spacecraft that have still been going since the 1970s. Now, I, I don't know exactly if, how, if, if this one will, will be going that long, but that's the limiting, yeah, that's the limiting factor there. So, so slowly but surely that, that, that will fade. Um, but we, but if it's still going, we, we've got many more years, and this thing's got to keep going if we, if we're going to scoop up these, uh, these samples and return them to Earth. So, and and they've also got techniques for being able to handle the lower amounts of power. You might not use uh, several instruments at once. You might uh, only operate it for a certain period of time, let the rover rest for a while. So there's a lot of different ways they can manage the power systems. Um, so even when it has less power available, they can still operate the rover. Um, because, you know, what this thing is operating on right now is 100 watts of power. Uh, which so, is incredible when you think about yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's uh, it's amazing that the power of a light bulb <laughs> can operate a car. <laughs> so, all right. Pretty, a pretty big light bulb. <laughs> yeah, pretty big light bulb. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go on to our very special guest. So I'm going to give this tablet back to Hunter. So or I'm going to give it to Andrew, who will give it to Hunter. There we go. And I'm going to sit down at my computer and turn my camera back on. There we go. And we are going to bring on our special guest. So special guest, if you could turn your camera on and turn your microphone on, that would be fantastic. There you go. This is Vandy Verma. And um, she is joining us via Zoom. Uh, she's a chief engineer for robotic operations at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory for the Mars 2020 Perseverance Rover. And uh, Vandy, thank you so much for joining us. This is so exciting. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excellent. And it's great to see that you have a replica of the rover. Yes, we do. And uh, I mean, it's we, we only have it for a short time. So we were lucky to get the rover and to get you for this show as well. So first thing I want to do is everybody always wants to know, especially if you work at JPL, which is such a magical place to work. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you get interested in robotics? Yeah, so, you know, I was actually born uh, you know, halfway around the world in India. And uh, when I was very young, I got a book that talked about space exploration. And it's just such a fascinating thing. It was more fascinating, as many of you know, than, you know, fairy tales you could read. So I was always fascinated with that. And then, uh, if many of you might know, the first rover that ever landed on Mars was the Sojourner rover on the Pathfinder mission in 1997. And I remember seeing that picture. There's this picture. It's a microwave-sized rover, so a lot smaller than the rover you're seeing back there. It was up against th this rock, Yogi Rock, and it was on Mars. And so I just remember looking at that and feeling, this is amazing that we are operating robots on Mars and, you know, uh, decided that's what I wanted to do. So I went to um, grad school and uh, got my PhD in robotics and uh, have been working on space robots ever since. That's amazing. And what's most exciting about your job? What, what's most exciting to you? What gets you what gets you going every day about this mission? You know, I think, I mean, when I, it, it's the details too. So I'm, you know, a roboticist. So I love the robotic parts that there is this machine that's intelligent enough to explore another planet that no human has ever been. So we're building a robot and it has to operate somewhere that we actually just partially know about. You know, you showed the flyover and the details, but still there's, there's a lot of detail there that we have to anticipate situations. So I love that aspect. And the other one is just, it's so far away. So it takes four minutes to 20 minutes, depending on where Mars is relative to earth, for just a one-way lifetime signal to get there. So you have to build it so, it can, you know, not 
require us to intervene. So I love that part. And just also being on the journey, I uh, got to drive opportunity. And as the rovers go exploring Mars, you kind of felt feel like you're transported with them over there. And I love that part. Like you get to explore another planet through the rovers. That, that was one of my favorite things about um, when I was first introduced to Spirit and Opportunity and the mission and mentioning that the camera mast is about six feet tall on, on both of those rovers. And it was as if a person were standing out. Now, I'm a, I'm a little shorter than six feet, but that's okay. As if a person were standing out looking on the surface of Mars. And that, that to me, that captivated me to no end. So that was that was really amazing. And, you know, actually that, you know, you remind me, so especially where Perseverance landed and I was sort of in mission control the day we landed on the rover side. Uh, I, you know, work on the robotic side. And you put on the 3D goggles because there's a, there's a whole uncertainty and ellipse. So entry, descent and landing is becoming more and more accurate, but we could have landed in a whole eight kilometer region in Jezero Crater. And so you're really excited to know exactly where did we end up in there? Because that's where we're going to have to drive from. And you put on those 3D goggles. So when we drive, if you look at an image and there's no relative features, there's no buildings on Mars. So just to see what scale is. But when you put on those goggles, something that might look quite flat, you start to see just the depression and it just comes alive. So you really feel like you're standing there and being able to see the, the terrain right in front of you. So I love that part. Yeah, and, and when Spirit and Opportunity landed, we were involved in, here in starting to work with some of those 3D images that came from those missions. And it just, that just, as you said, it brought it alive. It, it really started to make it seem like a place instead of just pictures. So that's really neat. So what is a, what do you do specifically for, for the rover mission? What's a typical day like for you? So what's really interesting about working on rover missions is it's not your job, you know, it's not just that no day is the same because every day you're exploring a new place that no one's ever been, but also as the mission lifetime progresses, your job changes. So it's, I have, when we are building the robots, uh, I work on the development of the rovers. I've written a lot of the software that runs on the rovers on the Mars, some of the intelligence so that it knows how to respond to the environment on the robotic side. And then as we land on the surface and start doing operations, uh, I work on the robotic operations elements, which is everything to do with driving the rover on the surface, getting from one place to the other. The advantage of having a rover is if you landed somewhere and it's very interesting, but you've deployed all your instruments and studied it, well, you can go to another place and you can keep going to new places. So the driving aspect and the other part um, I work on is the robotic arm where we're able to uh, position. And I think Andrew was showing the robotic arm it has a whole suite of instruments and we learn so much more by getting right up close to the surface and placing those instruments. And then another thing I think I was mentioning is that inside the robot is a whole different robotic system. So we take the drill, we dock it to the rover's body and it has bits that we exchange. So it's literally like your drill and you can exchange bits. We have a whole set of bits that are let us abrade surface core. And we are able, so that's sampling. We collect rock cores. We're collecting intact cores for return to earth. And so we, we are able to dock with the rover's body and uh, that sampling element we work on. And also the interface to the Ingenuity helicopter. The helicopter uh, flies and after it uh, needs to talk to earth, it talks through the rover. And so all of that aspects comes under robotic uh, operations. And so I work on all of those aspects uh, from you know, strategically thinking about what we should do you know, in terms of future, we are always developing new capabilities. So even as we are on the surface exploring, we're already thinking about what we're gonna do next, which is uh, even more capable. So uh, all of those aspects uh, get well, to work on. You shared some excellent images with me that uh, we want to share with our audience. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, we're gonna talk about a few of these images that you're so kind to send. And we're going to start with this one right here. And so Perseverance has been breaking interplanetary driving records um, while it's been operating. And it's only been operating for a year and a half. How is this possible? How is the a rover able to do this? So Perseverance has been really exciting. And it, it is 
capable of driving a lot faster than any rover that we've sent to Mars before. And we made a lot of upgrades to the rover, um, not just the fact that the wheels were redesigned. Uh, parts of it is when you look at the wheels, there's a tread on it, that grounds a pattern really actually impacts um, our ability to have traction and sand. They aren't, they aren't roads on Mars. So we're driving on freeform terrain. So mechanical changes like that. But another thing we've done is um, added a second computer. So we have a computer and a hardware FPGA processor that can process images. So as the rover is driving, it's taking images of the terrain, processing them to figure out where the obstacles are and how it should skirt around them. And that needs to happen really fast if you don't want to stop, think, and move, if you want to keep turning your wheels. Uh, which So it's capable of doing this new capability we call thinking while driving, which is it's thinking about what the hazard is, but still turning its wheels. Um, and that has made it a lot faster having the computers and upgraded cameras that have fast exposure times and a bunch of things like that. So we can, we, you know, we've been able to drive without new data from Mars, 700 kilometers, which is mostly limited by power. You were showing the RTG, which is great because it doesn't requ uh, require dependence on solar power, but at the same time, it's actually not that powerful. It's sort of like a light bulb. And so rovers take a lot of naps through the day. So we are limited by power in how far we drive and it's driven um, that much, but it did it over multiple days. So once, you know, initially we operate on Mars time. So we are in sync with the Martian day, which is 40 minutes longer than an Earth day. But, you know, we have people in our lives who live on Earth time. So eventually now we are on Earth time. So we take the weekends off. And so we send a plan for the entire weekend and that's how it drove that long. But in a single sol, we've been able to drive, uh, you know, 319.7 meters, almost 320 meters, which is, a, you know, a lot more than previous rovers can drive because of this. So it's been very exciting. We were able to, when we landed, we had capability to divert us away from hazards. Uh, and so as we were landing, we could actually land in Jezero, which was not possible with previous missions because it's got a lot of density of hazard which is also sometimes the most interesting scientifically. But because we knew that the capability on the land in the entry, descent and landing could divert us away from hazards, we were comfortable going to this place. But when it did the divert, it diverted us away from our prime location at the Delta. So this year we've spent some time doing what we call a rapid traverse, driving really fast to get there. And we were able to do it on the order of, uh, weeks, which is uh, pretty incredible, you know, covering kilometers in weeks. So this fast capability has allowed us to get to the science destination very quickly. So we uh, showed, Andrew was showing it before, we mentioned the robotic arm. Um, that robotic arm is incredibly amazing. As you said, it can it can act like a multi-tool and, and, uh, and, and change out drill bits and everything. Um, it can reach the surface. You have to place those instruments very close to the surface. How do you command the rover to do that from so far away? I've got a, which is now, I've got this picture up. It is now my new favorite picture of the rover. This is a picture of the robotic arm with the drill bit, with the drill right up against a rock. And actually, correct me if I'm wrong, it's partly in the rock when this picture was taken. Was that right? That's right. So that, that picture, um, you know, it was actually a situation where we had, uh, you know, benign um, anomaly. As, so the drill bed was just uh, as a precautionary measure was left in contact with the rock. So we have this unique picture, which we don't often have of the drill bed in contact with the rock. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that, why we land on the surface, we can do a lot from orbit, but the reason to get to the surface is because you can touch the surface and you can place instruments right up in contact and study them. And so there's this 2.1 meter long arm, it, it weighs, you know, 100 kilograms. And just that, what we call the turret, the part at the end of it, uh, that's like 45 kilograms. And most of that weight is instruments and, uh, you know, the drill. And we also have the ability, when we drill, we're doing these cuttings. And like any drill, it creates tailings around it. We have the ability, uh, we don't do it with the drill, but we do it with abrasion. So it can abrade the surface of rocks because the surface is exposed to Martian atmosphere and what's interesting is underneath. Uh, so all of these things require 
us to position the arm very close to rocks, we know where we only approximately know. So there's a lot of uncertainty. What we do is we drive to a location. At the end of the drive, we take pictures with the rover's camera. You were showing the mast. On that, in addition to the cam cam, you see the little squares. Those at the bottom, they are cameras. They're stereo. They are stereo cameras on the rover. It has two eyes, left and right eye. And just like a human eye, when you have two eyes, it can actually measure how far something is. And so you're looking at an image. It's an image with which we can get uh, three-dimensional data. So we know how tall a rock is and what edges it has. So once we get this picture down, we are able to plan in it and position the robotic arm. Now, the arm is so heavy, it has droop. There's a lot of uncertainty. So we account for all of that. And then we have to sequence all of these events and send them to Mars because the instruments, in order to get their measurements, sometimes you're placing instruments with very delicate lenses within centimeters of the surface. And uh, the, you, know, you don't actually want to have it make contact with the surface because you can't replace it and you've damaged this uh, very delicate instrument. So we do it by accounting for uncertainty. We know, oh, it can be in contact, but that rock could actually be one centimeter taller or one centimeter shorter than it's actually uh, based on all the data. So we do this analysis and we um, you know, try to more precisely position. We actually, at the other side of the drill, if you look at the drill, there's a bit on one end, on the other side, which is in your model too, there's a flat cylindrical surface. And that is called the facility contact. We actually flip the arm onto the other side and we touch the surface. Now that, when we touch it, we know exactly where something is. It's almost like using a little stick to walk around and you know we can measure it. So because our sensors like imagers give us some measurements and they have uncertainty, but the touch is more precise. So we'll also use that. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll touch it turn the turret around and place instruments more accurately. So that's how, that's how we place the robotic arm so close to the surface. So one of the other um, uh, capabilities that you work on is, is Aegis. And can you tell us a little bit about this? The, the rover uh, is able to do some of what it does completely autonomously. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. So, um, when they're driving, so the, one of the interesting things is when we're driving, there could be interesting things you miss. The, now that the rover can drive such long distances, uh, what if you drive right past the most interesting rock? So we have this capability where uh, the ro usually we take, get, drive to a location, take a picture, send it down, and then the scientists will be like, this is an interesting rock, and I'm going to zap that rock and study its chemical composition. If it's interesting from far away by zapping, I'm then gonna put the arm on it, which has you know, like an X-ray diffraction instrument and it has a Raman uh, spectrometer, gets more contact information. But you wanna get that at the end of a drive hours earlier. So without ground in the loop, as we say. So after a drive, before you know, we would have to take this image, send it down, and then the scientists would send up something. That's a whole day. Instead, after a drive, we take a picture, it takes it on its own, and then we have like intelligence on board the rover, which will detect what the most interesting rock in that image is. So you saw that rock and it was mostly dirt and there were two little interesting rocks. So it'll pick out of it, those are the interesting rocks. And then out of that, which is the more interesting between the two? And then it picked the target and it uh, will zap it with the laser. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into that because then you have to precisely know where it is in 3D space, zap it. Also, when you're zapping it, not hit any part of the rover's body autonomously because uh, the arm could be in the way and you don't want to zap the arm as you're trying to hit our surface rock that is past that behind it. So Aegis stands for Autonomous Exploration for Gathering Increased Science. We love our acronyms. Yes, yes, yes sir. <laughs> and, oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, so, and so that you, what you're seeing here is it picked those targets and then it took an image with a telescopic imager it has, which is the remote micro imager, the RMI. And those are two, you know, two circles, two images it took to give you really detailed um, composition of this rock that is, um, you know, five to seven meters away from the rover. So this uh, rover has a sidekick with it. 
and it's called Ingenuity. I wanted to show the uh, animated GIF of the flight of the helicopter. We've been mentioning it all, all throughout the show. Um, but you mentioned a very interesting factoid to me when we were chatting yesterday and when we were talking before the show started, and that was how far uh, perseverance can be from ingenuity. What was what was the little factoid that at least I found really interesting? I think our audience would find it interesting as well. Right. So, you know, in, this is one of the ingenuity flights. And I love these images. You know, these are actually taken by the helicopters, navigation cameras looking down to the surface. So they're not just images sent for us to look at, which is great, but it's also for navigation. Because as the helicopter is flying, it's trying to uh, the rover does visual odometry. It's using the difference between one image to the other to do rel navigation. And that uh, actually serves a purpose just to help it uh, control its flight. And you're seeing, you know, the blades uh, bet moving between the images. But as the helicopter flies after it's done, in order to talk to Earth, it has, a, you know, limited power. It talks to an antenna on the rover and then that we transmit down. And that's needs to be line of sight. So as we're driving, we need to ensure that we don't go behind some hill surface and have an occlusion between where the helicopter would land and the rover. And so we have actually two, you know, we have a helicopter and a robot. We've got two robots on Mars that we are uh, flying one, sometimes scouting, looking ahead to where the rover can go and we are driving. And we often do them on the same day. So if one, doesn't for some something happen and the flight didn't happen or the rover didn't drive, we need to make sure anywhere along that drive where the rover could stop or the helicopter could land, they're still okay communicating. So that makes it you know quite interesting uh, wow. to uh, look into that. That's really cool. And so the final uh, topic is something that people love to know about. And uh, some of the public's um, favorite images are the selfies. So I've got one of the rover selfies right here, and it was taking this picture while ingenuity or with the while the helicopter ingenuity was sitting next to it. How does the how does Perseverance take these uh, selfie images? Right. So this image here, as you're seeing, you know, it's so the rover. Um, there's no third thing to take an image, even though it looks like a perspective. This picture was actually taken by Perseverance itself. And it was right after we deployed the helicopter. So the helicopter rode to Mars, strapped under the rover's body. We deployed it, backed off, turned. And that was the only time they were gonna be next to each other because the helicopter is a demonstration and it needs to maintain 45 meters from the rover at all times after once you know we had deployed it. So we had this one chance to take this picture. And the way we do it is um, we use the robotic arm on the rover at the end of it, is a microscopic imager, which is used to take close-up images of the surface of rocks. That's what it's for. So it only, if you point it to the rover, it only covers a small part of the rover. Uh, we use that and move it around to stitch together. Uh, in this particular case, we took 62 images and they are stitched together to create that image you're seeing, which is the selfie. So it literally is holding a camera up and looking at itself, except it's doing lots of images. Well, your your uh, your uh, imagery processing folks are amazing uh, to be able to make it look so good. So um, one thing I want to mention to our audience is uh, if you want to hear even more from Vandy, um, this is not your only chance to do that. Um, she's going to be featured in the next episode of the JPL podcast series on a mission. And the episode will be available starting August 25th. So if you're watching this show live, it's available tomorrow. If you're watching this show after August 24th, it is available uh, starting. August 25th uh, from Apple Podcasts and SoundCloud. So last chance, Randy, anything else you want to mention to our audience before you sign off with us for today? You know, it's just so exciting to have people interested and engaged in this exploration. It really is an important element because um, part of it is, you know, at NASA, a big, big element is the education and uh, public engagement. So I'm you know, it's really exciting to hear from everybody and see the interest. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. We really appreciate it. And um, we want to wish you good luck on the rest of the mission and go Percy. And you are welcome here at the other planetarium anytime. So if you ever uh, find your way coming through Chicago, just let us know. All right. So thank you so much.
And we are going to move on to the very last part of the show. So Vandy is going to turn off her microphone and uh, camera there. She's still in the background. Um, so if anybody has any last questions, just let us know. Anyway, last part I want to talk about. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So give me just a second. There we go. All right. So I've got one last thing to tell you about. And that is um, we've got mars in the sky later this year and mars is going to do something kind of interesting well first off it's going to be do a couple things kind of interesting so we are going to um show you our favorite uh sky uh visualization tool and that is called stellarium so let me go to stellarium and give me a second all right this is a free online uh uh sky visualization tool called Stellarium, stellarium-web.org. And what I've got is Mars set up for November 30th of this year. It's called opposition. And on that night, that means Mars is opposite the sun in the sky. And so when the sun goes down, Mars comes up. So if you want the brightest time of year to be able to see Mars, we're talking that November, December timeframe. But there's one event that I just want to briefly highlight to be able to show you what's going on. So I'm going to set Stellarium for December 7th. Notice there's the moon. I've got Stellarium set for Chicago. Notice the moon is getting a little closer. And we're talking about full moon. Whoops. Mars is not as big as the full moon in the sky. So I'm going to zoom in a little farther. Give me a second. I'm doing this with my fingers on my keyboard instead of my mouse. So I'm going to set this for getting close. So I've got this set for Chicago for uh, this is 6.50 p.m. Whoops. And then I'm going to forward 7.50. Whoops. And it's a little farther. Hang on. And then I'm going to go forward in time to 8.50. Then I'm going to step forward minute by minute. Ah, again, hard to do on my screen with just my fingers doing the pinching part. All right, so there we go. Going forward, going forward, going forward. Notice what is happening. That is called an occultation. The moon is going to occult or block Mars. And you can find out if this is going to be visible for you on the night of December 7th into the morning of December 8th. So depending, there are certain spots on planet Earth to be able to see this. And so to be able to see this, uh, go to Stellarium, dial up your location, try to get your exact location in there if you can, dial up December 7th, the evening of or the morning of December 8th. Go forward in time, see if the moon is going to cover Mars as seen from your location. Here in Chicago, we'll be able to see this happen at about uh, 10 minutes after 9 p.m. Central Time. Mars will reappear at approximately 10.05 p.m. Now that time is not necessarily the same for everybody. As a matter of fact, it is not the same for everybody. So check your specific location and your specific time. Look at that. Mars has reappeared at about 10.05 p.m. Central Time here in Chicago. If it is clear that night, we are going to watch this and broadcast it live from our Doan Observatory, which I can see out the window right here in our solar system gallery. And our observatory is open tonight as well. Um, so we are open every Wednesday night. So we want you to come out and come see us and look through our big 24-inch telescope sometime. Um, so I just wanted to briefly point out there is something interesting to see in the sky. And as you're looking at Mars in the sky, know that there is a car. there are two car-sized rovers trucking around on the surface doing a lot of cool stuff, driven by amazing people like Vandy and others at JPL. And um, we're learning a lot about the red planet. So um, I want to just uh, look over to Hunter and find, whoops, and find out if all is good. Do you have any, all good, Andrew? Are we all good? So, it's, it's been a pleasure to show off this amazing device here. Like I said, we can watch Mars in the sky. And even 
well, if it looks like a pinpoint of light, it's just amazing to imagine there are thousands of people working on driving these things over the surface. It's really incredible. Exactly, exactly. So thank you everyone for joining us for Sky Observer's Hangout. We had a blast talking with you about our favorite planet. Well, one of our favorite planets in the solar system. We hope we can see you here at the Other Planetarium. And uh, just again, Jennifer is going to put a link in the chat um, about how you can purchase tickets and come see us and come see the rover model. Um, uh, between now and the end of December. We're open to the public every Wednesday night from 4 to 10 p.m. And if it's clear out, our observatory is open. So that is what Hunter and I are going to go do right now is open our observatory. So uh, we have a lot to do tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us for Sky Observers Hangout. We love showing uh, you the night sky. We'll see you again on a future episode. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.